Hey everybody, it's Joe Solari here with the wonderful Craig Martell. Coming to you live from the subarctic. And today we're going to talk about writing compelling fiction. So Craig, I know you've uh, been very busy writing books um, on craft and how to uh, market, touch of advertising. Um, thought we would, uh, well, we were actually going to do this a while ago. Our schedules just got a little too busy when this book came out. So we're a little bit behind the times, <clears throat> yep, um, yep. gave me time to read it. And I think it's a great book. I love some of the stuff you guys have hit on, but maybe give a little background about like how you got hooked up with Larry and came to get this book written. It comes back to relationships. You were just at NINC, uh, last week I was in Vegas, uh, getting uh, 20 books, Vegas set up. Uh, last year, 20 Books Vegas 2018, uh, Michael Anderley introduced me to Mike Bray, who runs a publishing company, Wolfpack Publishing. It's still self-published, but it's a uh, publishing company, small press. And uh, uh, Mike had a guy who wrote a book on write compelling fiction back in 2008, revised it in 2014, and it needed revised again to target the indie market to help indies. And so uh, uh, Mike asked me, hey, would you be interested in... in working with, with Larry, an, an established author. He's over 70 years old. He's been writing Westerns for over 30 years, very successful. His wife is very, very successful, New York Times bestselling author of her own books. So he said, as a team, they, they come together pretty good, but they don't have the, they're traditional. So what mm. would it take to have that indie slant? And so I looked at it. I worked with some uh, great beta readers, some other authors, <clears throat> and we, we uh, reorganized it, re-wickered it. I added in, I don't know, maybe 10,000 words on my own. And uh, all of a sudden, hey, we've got a book that really appeals to indies in a way that's palatable. And also we found it appeals to readers. So readers can understand what they're, what they're reading and how uh, to uh, verbalize why they like a book. <clears throat> so hopefully help their reviews as well as their understanding. And then they buy uh, better and better books like, like mine and Larry's. <laughs> <clears throat> so Mike, uh, Mike asked me, Hey, would you be interested? I looked at him like, yeah, we can work with this. And so I talked to Larry a few times and he said, Hey, no problem. Uh, we relate, we get along well. And uh, we took, tackled this project and I spent more time on it. I thought, ah, this is going to be quick and easy. Come on, man. This is like uh, the three trip Home Depot uh, uh, project. Uh. So uh, <laughs> we went back and forth and the beta readers came back with some input. So we had to re-wicker some things. And I, I really like the end product. And this is also a, a demonstration of how, how we can work. Because I, I added in it in as book four of the successful indie author series. It's published by Wolfpack Publishing. Whereas the other three are published by me, but on the series page, all four are there. Mm. So the series page includes three self-published titles and a small press published title because they're all part of the same series. Interesting. Interesting. Was there anything special you had to do to make that happen? No, I just sent an email. Okay. And they, they took care of it. That's great. I mean, the, 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 it's not like I was trying to work something in because the, I had all the covers done. The covers are all brand consistent. Mm-hmm. And they're uh, and they're they're good, which uh, it's interesting because the title right before that they hadn't uh, Amazon hadn't added collaborations to the mm -hmm. series page. So I said, oh, by the way, add collaborations and this one too. And now collaborate a book on collaborations is written just by me, no collaboration. But the book on uh, the next <laughs> book is is a collaboration. Um, there's a little irony for you. But I think that's good to know. So as people are making decisions about how they're going to go to market, they don't feel it's an all or nothing thing, especially with series, right? I think that's yep. something that um, a lot of authors are in that world right now where um, they may have a couple books that they've already done with, um, you know, a traditional publisher. Now they want to continue on. Can they, yep. you know, and what you're saying there is even if they, the traditional publisher still has the rights, there's, an opportunity for you to continue that person to continue in that series and keep the continuity for the reader, right? That benefits well, both the publisher and the, it goes the to the reader experience. The, uh, cause some traditional publishing contracts, they only own the rights to sell the book. They don't own the characters and, and that. So you'll see somebody write like four books in a, with a traditional house, but then they want to keep that series going. 
So they have to like sue to get their rights back to keep the series going. But if Amazon and the readers don't care, say you add a book five, a book six mm-hmm. to the series, if your contract allows that, or all you have to do instead of saying, let's, let's break this up. You can, uh, and try to sue to get your rights back. You can say, say, Hey, you keep the first four. I'm going to publish book five, six, seven myself. Mm-hmm. And can I get a writer saying, yes, that's okay, even though I don't need to, but I don't want another lawsuit. It's nice to have a piece of paper. And it's easier to do that than it is to uh, uh, sue and get your rights back on the original four. Right. I mean, just the cycles that you save, not having to do that emotionally that, and, and financially, and that, that's a great thing. And I think it also starts to break down those barriers of that us and them thing where it's like, mm-hmm. hey, I've gotten this deal. Those books are out there. They're doing a pretty good job, but I've personally made a business decision that, um, you know, I want to continue this myself as an indie. I can go do that and layer those into that same series. And guess what? It's going to help both parties, right? Yep. Yep. Um, That's right. That's right. So I, I think that's great. And I think that, um, you know, the world's changing so much, right? When you look at, um, We'll have him on here eventually, but you know what Chris Kennedy's doing with his publishing company. I think that last year or this year they ha- they were nominated for the most Dragon Awards. Oh yeah, the last year it was five five. Yeah. Last year being twenty eighteen, yeah. he had Chris Kennedy Publishing had five titles. Yeah, that were finalists. Yeah, and I think it, it was the same this year. And if you look, he's got a, a he's got a mix of folks that have had a long illustrious career in traditional and Mm -hmm. then are, and are also, uh, you know, now thinking about indie or mixing it all up. And that, that whole model is so, um, so transient now that it's not, you can't have an us in them because there's things that are great from how traditional publishers work that you may want to adopt yourself. Right. And there's other things that they're starting to adopt. Yeah. Um, so this, I think, adds another layer of, you know, when you're an author thinking about how you could work with maybe a past relationship. Yep. And this, yep. Now, with Wolfpack, their, kind of their model is they're helping mainly Western authors, right? It, it's mostly Westerns, and, and also they buy rights and license. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of publications of old books, and they tap that market early where uh, a lot of the original contracts from 70s and 80s didn't contemplate the ebook. So they're limited to print. So the authors say, hey, I, I'd like to have an ebook of this. And I can, and Wolfpack uh, put, uh, picked up a lot of those, a great mm-hmm. deal. I think they have over a thousand titles yeah. out now. And they, they, uh, they always do very, very well in the Western Writers Association uh, awards, as well as uh, uh, for their writers. It's a, it's a good model, but they're, they're taking new authors as well who are writing in certain genres. And Western is, is Western and men's fiction are their, their genres. Mm-hmm. Well, and you got to give them props that the, you know, the owner is coming to a conference like 20 books, yeah. even if it's just, let, let's just say it's totally nefarious. It's just to steal ideas on what can come out of indie. Awesome for his portfolio of authors, right? Because he's yep. thinking yep. how he can help them with these uh, strategies that indie authors are using. I think it's great. Well, this, this, this is where it helps having the show in Vegas because Mike lives in Vegas. So it's real easy for him to stop by. He actually only lives about a mile from Samstown. <clears throat> so that, that makes it easy. I mean, uh, Vegas is the, the indie and publishing powerhouse central of the, the United States. You might think it's New York City, but it's, uh, it's Vegas. You can get more done in Vegas quicker and mm-hmm. with the right people, everybody can get to Vegas. It's really easy. And actually, we got we got another pickup for our uh, our screenwriter panel, another well established uh, screenwriter. We'll announce him later after we're confirmed with him. But uh, uh, besides John Truby and Terry Tatchell, two uh, very successful Hollywood screenwriters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've got another one coming, and this guy uh, does it. It's interesting. He writes westerns, but his screenwriting credits are all horror. It's crazy. <laughs> Well, you never know, right? Yeah. Um, so let's kind of d- unpack the book for folks. Like, why, why, um, why, 
why would somebody want to read this book and what is it? Let me kind of start off with, you know, I, I'm about halfway through it. Um, and what I pulled out of it was there was some really great um, passages where uh, Larry and you take um, uh, sections from your books and show how just by changing a few words, you can change the book's tone, the character uh, characterization, um, how people feel about the scene. Um, there, I'm kind of throwing a lot at you, so probably have to break each one of these up. Just one of the one of the cool things was how. Well, let's just talk about that. Just let's talk about characterization first, because I got another one that I thought was really cool too. So let's go with that. <clears throat> Well, one thing Larry talks about was uh, POV, how to dis how to work uh, uh, the point of view on what you write. And if you write first person POV, you really limit what you can do within a story. However, you make it uh, more personal. So for your story, if that's okay, if that's what you want to do, uh, then go with first person POV. But we're both big fans of third person Omni because then you can give different perspectives. You can change the camera angle mm -hmm. within the scene and first person, you can never change the camera angle. It's a, uh, it's a GoPro attached to the person's head. That's it. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, now my, my first books that I wrote were uh, post-apocalyptic survival. First person is the way to go because yeah. it's always through this, this lens and you don't have that many characters to switch around. And, and, uh, and on that, um, there's some genres that th that's kind of the, like urban fantasy tends to be lean towards that, right? That they like, there's, I know people write <clears throat> both, but yeah. it seems that like first person, post-apocalyptic's one that, it, you know, being in the guy's head is important. Yeah. Yeah, post-apoc is huge on first person and there's, and, and there are some other genres that first person is appropriate. And then there are genres where it's not. Hmm. And uh, I, know, I know romance is hit or miss whether you go first person or not, uh, especially if you're trying to get both perspectives as the two uh, think about why they should get together or, or what's going on in their lives. If you have first person, it's all filtered through that one lens. And that makes it a challenge. So uh, just know that going in. And don't uh, set yourself up. Know what your genre uh, calls for, because mm, yeah. then that uh, that also helps guide what you do. And uh, uh, taking a scene apart. Uh, this is one thing Larry did really, really well with some of his. He said, "Ah, here's here's a first sentence, and it's not bad." And I looked at him like, ah, it, "It really is bad." But <laughs> he goes back through and he says, well, "Let's change this. Let's remove this word. Let's let's shorten this. Let's change the perspective." Uh, like the uh, the guy that challenges him when he walks into a bar, his main mm -hmm. character, and he shoots the guy. He said, we can work this this way or this way or this way, and all of a sudden, now you have the setup for the whole book. You, you're sympathizing or you're not, or you're just, uh, this guy's a hokum, so who cares if you, mm -hmm. if you shoot him or not? And There are so many different ways. He deconstructs uh, 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 riding out of town. How, how can you shape that? to uh, help further the story. Do you make it so you turn your your uh, uh, readers off? Because mm -hmm. he said, oh yeah, he rode the horse till it died and then went and looking for another horse. And you're like, what the hell? And he and he discusses that about now, now you just killed your horse and you don't care. And there's no uh, a cowboy in the world would be okay with that. Yeah. that you just killed, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's gonna be traumatic. Oh my God, my horse. Now, could you trade your horse? Ah, oh, okay. Now let's. That's a different perspective. The tra mm. uh, the trauma of doing that, <clears throat> and even though it's western, because I'm writing uh, space lawyer, right? You know what I'm reading in order to help me improve and, and tighten my prose? Louis L'Amour and Zane Grey. Mm. I'm reading old old westerns because they told a story that was impact that flowed. They gave you just enough on the characters to to keep the story moving forward. So that's, uh, I like those. And every time I read, I read a page or two and it's like, okay, cool. Let me, let me tweak my wording here and move forward. Mm. Space lawyers based on Louis L'Amour. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was, uh, the other part of that was how he did the same thing with, um, giving descriptions in the scene, right. In yeah. the sense of like, and, and I kind of got it. And then when he went back and showed it, 
it, it was it was even more obvious that like okay this wasn't just x you know a, an info dump that clearly wasn't that but then you could see how you know he, you can go through that and just by sprinkling those things in in a certain way you you're you're moving the story forward but you're also setting the scene yep yep and and like you said he does a, an inordinate amount of research into the into the era in order to pepper those things in like the the brass spittoon he'll mention that that's two words but it sets the era because mm -hmm. nobody has a brass spittoon on the floor now and haven't for a hundred years or 70 years mm -hmm. so what uh, it, that automatically puts you in the scene without saying it was 1881 and yeah 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 you don't have to do the uh, orson welles voice in the background <laughs> So, um, with, 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 with the book, um, how, how do you, ex how do you see readers, you know, using this material and kind of pulling, pulling this into how can, when you were talking with Larry, help both, um, kind of indie authors as well as, you know, I know when he, you told me when he originally wrote it, it was really focused for the traditional market and helping mm -hmm. authors were trying to get in there. So how have you guys kind of helped to make that? you know, a useful well, tool the, in the 21st century. Well, the, the original target market for that book was for authors to appeal to acquisition editors. Oh, yeah. And if the acquisition editor picks it up because it's in that genre, so it was, it was forced on, here's how all the writers in this genre write, so you must write like this. And here's what they do well that you might miss when you just read their books. <clears throat> so he deconstructed that. <clears throat> now, I put in my science fiction uh, angles and it's still the same, but the, the target is the reader. And, and Leonard Elmore has the quote of the, the book and it says, I leave out the parts that the readers tend to skip. Mm -hmm. So how do you always keep the reader reading and engaged? And that's one thing we're tightening the prose up because uh, Larry takes a whole sen a whole paragraph and tightens, tightens it down to like an eight word sentence and then keeps moving. Don't mm. give the chance a reader. Don't give the reader a chance to ever put the book down, mm. and that's that's what we try to get with tightening your prose. So for a an author, it gives you a, a framework within which to guide your words. Look for these triggers that says you're losing it, and and then tighten it and bring it back in. And uh, uh, we give a lot of examples just so you can keep it in mind while you're writing and crafting your own narrative mm. as a reader. You can look through and say, yes, that's why I like this story or that's why I don't like this story. Because if you add in, if you go from a thriller to a, a high fantasy, now you're going to, the high fantasy, you're going to get a lot of adjectives, a lot of flowing prose, maybe a whole page. Whereas in a Western, that might be four words. <laughs> but in fantasy, yeah. it might be a whole page with mm. flowing, flowery, and all the senses, how your eyes and ears and ah, the scent of the of the the burgeoning spring, the willows blossoming, and and uh, <clears throat> in in a western, it might be damn hay fever's acting up. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I also um, recently was watching one of those master classes with Sorkin, and he was talking about how it's kind of was, you know, the only time a char you need to know that the character is five year was five years old was when what happened when they were five years old is part of moving the story forward. Right? Yeah. And um, I think that's kind of in the same vein as like putting the story first and the experience of that story versus you know, maybe in your mind, you know what happened when the character was that age, but it's like, how do you do that? You don't have to tell like their whole life story. It's that one moment that may be yeah. the reckoning that's driven the whole story. Yep. Right? Yep. Cool. <clears throat> and, and setting the stage for, for the future story without dragging the story down. Mm. You don't ever want to. And that's what this whole book, right? Compelling fiction is about uh, uh, keeping the book in the reader's hands. So it's tightening, it's uh, keeping the story moving, it's action. As Larry says, uh, enter late, leave early on the mm -hmm. scene. Yeah, enter when stuff's already happening, so you gotta, you gotta get into it, and then leave right when it ends, as opposed to dragging it out, like uh, the, the uh, Battle of the Five Armies. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, uh, that kind of went on and on and on after it was already over. 
<laughs> so how, how do you make sure you enter late, leave early, keep, keep the people engaged and get into the next uh, uh, action scene, which is drama, which is conflict. Cool. So here's a question for you, like going through this process, how did it change your writing? <clears throat> can, you, can you kind of pinpoint how you feel that there's been an influence by working on this book in your books? The, the, the Westerns. Yeah. <clears throat> more engagement with the Westerns and understanding what they're trying to do and what they're able to do with the story. So removing, removing a lot of words, uh, tightening, tightening scenes and, and being more aware of the conflict. Cause I, I do a fair amount of scene setting, but I don't do a lot of descriptions. I let the uh, reader imagine what, what color the protagonist is or, or what kind of alien race. I'll give a very general description, humanoid. Mm -hmm. And leave it at that, and they can paint in whatever colors they want on that yeah. on that creature, because it, it's it's really irrelevant to the story. The story is the action. The story is how they engage. I'm I'm huge huge on dialogue, so I added in uh, some of that part those parts to uh, to the book, mm -hmm. because dialogue in my books dialogue is is fifty percent of the battle. How oh, do yeah. they the characters interact? And then the little things they do in between those interactions and other things that might uh, create the conditions for a conversation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I added in that stuff, but yeah, uh, the scene setup and flow, uh, I'm improving mine because of Westerns that were written a hundred years ago. That's crazy, isn't it? Right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And I'd uh, say improving because I, I, I've already gotten feedback from my readers saying, oh, man, I really like the flow of this one. Mm -hmm. When readers are mentioning flow, then, yeah. you know, you, you know, you got it. That's uh, that's really interesting. Um, so um, kind of going off the is there anything else you kind of felt that the book delivered? I mean, like I said, I've only gotten about halfway through it, so I'm I, I can't like push through, but it's like. <laughs> um, it's just been one of those months, right? With yeah, all the conferences yeah. and um, no sleep, no sleep. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the big thing for the book that, uh, that I found and support is that the genre is almost irrelevant. It's the story that's King. You have to hit certain tropes, but the story People come for the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, hard science fiction, maybe they come for the science, but the vast majority of readership will fall in love with your story for the characters, for the story, uh, the technology. Everything is a backdrop to the characters you see on the screen. Mm, awesome. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of talk about what story can do to communicate ideas, but we forget that it's, it's really about that getting that emotional experience, right? Like pe people yeah. are reading, reading books. A lot of the re readers that are reading these books are reading it for an emotional escape, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean it has to be like fluffy and like they're trying, it's, they're trying to have some type of experience without the risk. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if it's kind of like your high action stuff, it's, they want to have those feelings and that, edge of this without actually having aliens point guns at them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a relationship with the characters that they can yeah. have. It's a, it's risk-free uh, besides the fact that the story ends because misery uh, in uh, Stephen King's movie, uh, that wasn't quite ri risk-free for uh, <laughs> his reader. <laughs> true, true. <clears throat> cool. So um, what, as we kind of wrap up here, why don't you kind of give everybody a feel for like, um, you know, the series now where we're at in it. I know not the, because we're, you and I had scheduled conflicts where you're actually a book ahead of us. So next is pricing strategies, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, t tapping a few uh, words into that yesterday, but uh, I got uh, 5,200 words on my work in progress, which I need to finish. That's over 50,000 words, and I think it'll wrap up around 60, 65,000, but I know all the stories at the end, so I need to wrap that up. That's my Space Lawyer, uh, book seven, and then the next book is going to be Pricing Strategies. I've got a lot of the notes. I had a, uh, 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 an hour-long conversation with folks in 20 books. Uh, I did a Facebook Live a couple days ago on that and <clears throat> got some more input for what people are looking for. And I apologize, uh, kids lit, no idea. Uh, that's a, 
how will a kid's lit box set and pricing? I don't have any idea. I don't have any firsthand knowledge for the folks that are successful. They do so many different things and there's so few of them that, uh, that I know. So uh, I apologize, but uh, it probably won't address any of those. However, for the general fiction market, uh, whether wide or uh, Amazon exclusive, I've got uh, a lot of data and information. So pricing strategies next, and then uh, marketing yourself without feeling like you have to take a long hot shower afterward. Mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, coming along. Nora Phoenix and I, we have a contract. She's going to write about half of it uh, from her, how she built up her readership through social media and through engagement. And uh, uh, mine will be on uh, just from my business experience as a business uh, coach. Mm -hmm and uh, uh, as a, uh, a business consultant, as an introvert, how did, I, how did I manage and what were the things we were teaching people for how to engage? Because people get to be CEOs because they're, they're business minded, they do these things and a lot of them just go into their office and hide. So how do you get them out where they can have a successful conversation with uh, the front lines uh, without being slimy about it? Like, hey, I'm mm -hmm. down here to get you to work better. No, 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 don't take that approach. Yes, that's what you want. However, that's not what you want to say. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you do it so you both feel good at the end of it and, uh, and things like that. So that's what self-marketing will all be, be about. I'd like to have both volumes out before Vegas. I'm not sure if we'll have the self-marketing one done, but uh, definitely we'll have the pricing strategy one done because that's next after I finish this uh, book, which should be the next few days. I should start mm -hmm. it and probably be done because I have a lot of the framework. I have everything I need to talk about. I just need to jam the words in. Sure, sure. And I, I, I haven't watched it, but I know um, when I had Brian Meeks on the channel, he and I got into more on the analytical side of, of pricing in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff there too for folks that are interested in that. Yeah. Um, well, and that's one, that's one of the things like uh, Brian gets nine ninety nine for his non fic books that are the same size as most other ones, but he puts a full support structure behind those yeah. for your nine ninety nine. You also get. Yeah. An that, asset. So there, there value. is a lot of that. Like, so I, with Susie's um, um, last book that she did, which is this, this packing one. Um, part of that is it's, the pricing of the book is similar to other books, but then there's this whole thing. Like if you want to go into this coursework and do things, then there's, there's a benefit to doing that through the book that you get it at a much lower price to go into the course. If that's what you want to do, because you kind of, yeah. so th yeah, that's the other thing is, is understanding what you're trying to do with your business. If you're just selling books, um, you know, what's your strategy and I know you get into this, but you know, with using Kindle Unlimited or not going wide or hybriding the thing or you want the highest profitability for your marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now you can change marketing strategy for, uh, but if you have, if this is how you're going to market it, what is the best price and process to maximize that profitability? Yeah. And I, th I remember, you know, we, we talked a bit about it is that, um, <clears throat> you know, I've yet to, because I used to have a pricing analytics business, I've yet to see anything that you could um, tease out of the data that shows that price um, drives um, long-term volume, right? Okay. Um, yep. Just, be, yep. just because we're dealing with a product that quality has so much to do with it, right? Yes. And, and, and if you like the author, you're going to buy it no matter what the price is quality brand perception. Cause yeah. you see a new book come out from if JK Rowling puts out a book, especially if she publishes a new Harry Potter book, Harry Potter eight, the mm -hmm. Potter plus 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if, if she, Harry goes our being, <laughs> if she personally writes that she could put 39 99 for an ebook and she'd sell a million copies. Yep. And, and that, so, where does that fit in for a new author? Where, like an author like me, okay, now I have a hundred titles published. People know my name, but if I want new readers in, can can I get nineteen ninety nine for an ebook on the headliner series? This is my best selling. Here's the newest book. Uh, it's nine ninety nine ebook. 
or would I alienate old readers? What, and this is uh, all part of the conversation that we'll have. Mm-hmm. What uh, establishing the reader expectations and yeah. managing those, and also what is the value of your brand? How do you determine that? And I can I can give some theory on that as well as some numbers, but uh, it's still everybody has to uh, evaluate their own worth. You've seen uh, you've been with twenty books for a while now, and you've seen people pop up saying. I'm a new author, but I spent five years writing this, and uh, I'm not publishing it for less than seven ninety nine. Okay, good luck with that, man. Mm-hmm. So they publish it for, and then you never hear from them again because <laughs> uh, the book doesn't sell, and they get disillusioned. People don't appreciate me. No, no, they don't know you, mm. and that's it, there's a significant difference between between the two. It could be the best book ever. It could be the next Freakonomics. It could be the best uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone, whichever. Uh, a, a market you apply to and, and but it still has to start somewhere you have to build your brand and if you write one book and there's only one book and it is your masterpiece then you are going to have significant problems finding that core and expanding it get that snowball rolling mm. where everyone is willing to pay 9.99 for an ebook because you're you right right that's you know you're looking at um in the case how do you put it? So, so the, 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 the strategy that has the most weight there is the reader writer relationship. Like have yeah. you established a, a, a group of readers that are following yeah. your work, right? That has, now you can use pricing strategies and tactics to build that yes. down the road, yeah. be in a position where you could charge thirty nine ninety nine. But in well, today's it, market, you're in a, certainly in a situation where, depending on the genre, um, there's just some indications that are going to get the reader to look at your book faster, right? So like you said, it is from marketing. If it makes sense to do 99 cents for some marketing strategy, then go for it. But also remember that at that price, if you're typically selling at three ninety nine, that means you need to sell almost 10 books to sell one. Right. And that's exactly how I've got the book organized. Hmm. What's marketing, what's advertising, what are promotions? Yeah. Cause it's, you have uh, different avenues of addressing your readership. How do you uh, provide your current readership, uh, throw them a bone. <clears throat> and this is maybe you don't want to change price. Like, Hey, I publish my books at four ninety nine. I will drop it in one year for a 99 cent promotion to bring new readers on board. And in between, if you're following me on my newsletter, I'm going to give you a thousand, two thousand word short story on this character's backstory. Mm. No one else will get that, but I'm never going to drop the price of my book. That's managing reader expectations to a way where first you, you sell the book at full price. And second, you, where you, uh, get the, uh, yeah. Uh, was doing that the change style. up or the fastball? I can't remember. Was, uh, doing the European style. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, where you get them to then follow you on email because you want that. That is your connection. And whether you publish the next book in a month or a year, if you have their email, you can let them know, Hey, next book is out. Mm. So it doesn't matter if you're publishing a book a month then they're going to just see it naturally. But if you're publishing a book a year, you have to reach out and tell them that that next book is out. Otherwise they won't see you. You'll disappear. So Mm. pricing strategies, these are all the things that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. Uh, very similarly to what you just heard, but it'll be in a concise package mm-hmm. that uh, I'll charge four ninety nine for, and won't change the price for a year. <laughs> but if you follow me, no, I'll put on. I'll probably uh, discount it sometime. I'll give a bunch. Oh, that's right, giveaways are going away on Amazon. So yeah, giving I saw away. That. I, I have no idea what's going to follow that. Because that's, I would release uh, like a new book for, for 20 books and I'd give the first 20, 50 copies away. Just say, hey guys, here, here you go. Peace, unity, love. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but now without that, I don't know there's a way because otherwise it's buy 50 copies for people and you get individual codes. What a pain in the ass. Now people have to email me, me and I have to email back the code. I tried to do it with audiobooks. Hey, here's an audio code. Whoever claims it first, just type claimed and what a debacle that was mm. because three people were typing claims at the same time. Somebody would get on claim and the others would be like, Oh, Hey, it's not available. What? And I'm like, uh, it, uh, it didn't work well. It, mm. it uh, actually worked very poorly and uh, created some uh, conflict where I didn't want any. I wanted to give copies of the yeah. audiobooks away. And instead, no, I had a uh, freaking a total food fight uh, and, and unhappiness on my hands. So, 
We don't want that. So what's going to replace it? I don't know. We'll find out. Maybe something will be in place by Vegas. Maybe not. And if not, then maybe we bring that up. Hey, that was a good program. Let's, uh, what can we do? Mm, yeah. It's just a, just a question. I mean, I'm sure they have something because you got to be able to gift stuff. Yeah. I want, and I, I think I like that, followers. Well, and the other thing you have to remember with that program is, is that, you know, we're always coming for this from the lens of authors and yeah. giveaway for people that are doing fulfillment by Amazon is a massive, massive yeah. advertising tool. Yeah. Um, and they actually have more tools in there than authors have, right? Like, Hey, if you watch this video, you can get this. Hey, if you know, and they have pieces there where, you know, the whole idea is if you didn't win the, the giveaway, you get a coupon, right? So there's, yeah. there's a whole marketing piece there that I'm just assuming is going to get better because Amazon makes a ton of money off of those people. Like it's not, they have skin in that game. It's not. Well, I think their main, their main source of revenue is advertising after, cause their, uh, their yeah. server services is number, is number one. one. And I think advertising on Amazon is number two. For, yeah. For so profit. I just, I just did a, um, I was at Nink and I spoke and that was one of the things I brought up is, is that, so, uh, the contribution margin, mm -hmm. 80% of it comes from, uh, excuse me, 70% of it comes from, uh, AWS and, uh, 20% of it is coming from, um, advertising and the rest is from everything else. Yeah. If you, if you look at the money that they've made from selling stuff and you subtract out the money they're losing overseas, trying to break into markets, Amazon's never made money selling stuff, right? Yeah. It's where they're making their money is fulfillment. So that running those fulfillment centers, doing delivery, um, AWS and advertising and advertising is the fastest growing of yes. those three. Well, I so, think it, they were 2.1 billion profit last year, year before, and their target was 21 billion. I thought by 2020. Yeah. And they're, so the numbers right now, so last year they did like just under 11 billion in advertising sales. Okay. They've done 10 billion to this point in the year. But remember, they're just like any retailer. Everything happens in the last quarter, yeah. right? So like yep. they're yep. gonna double that up in the next three months. So get ready, get mm -hmm. ready. <laughs> so, oh, and the other thing to keep in mind with advertising costs, this is something I've been telling some folks about is, we're going into an election cycle. So you'll be, on Facebook, you'll be competing with all the uh, political ads. So don't, don't but, be surprised you see costs going up there too. But they've uh, parceled those out because political ads are now, you have to request, hey, these, this is a political ad. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those might fall into a different category for competition for space. Because some we'll readers see. don't allow political ads. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people can turn off. I don't want any political ads. So yeah, we'll see. I mean, I can't imagine that um, Zuckerberg is going to not take that money, whether it's he, from the Russian mafia yeah. or. No, no, he will. <laughs> right? Whoever pays the price after certifying, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly. a Russian governmental influence. Uh, click the box here. Yeah. I'm not a robot. I love the one that says I'm not a robot. And a, and a robot arm comes up and taps the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I just, I just think it's something people should keep in mind going into 2020. I'm not saying I know anything other than just like, hey, these guys learned in the last election cycle that that Facebook, social media advertising is very influential. Yeah. And we yeah. forget sometimes that while we're focusing on, well, we're selling books. Yeah. It's only this, there's one set of eyeballs and whether it's coming, sell me a book or vote or buy a new car, it's all got to be absorbed. And it's all competing for the same headspace. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On the, on the single entity of a mm -hmm. user. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I can say, because I know this from my clients is advertising is not the only solution, right? I'm not saying it's, you know, in context of folks that are not doing a lot of advertising, they're working really, really, really hard yes. at other types of promotion, right? Yes. Yes. That you, that you, if I told you what they were, you may be like, there's no way I'm doing that. It's like, 
I know you're not going to do that, right? You're not yeah. going to go to 16 conventions a year, yeah. right? Um, but that works for that person really mm-hmm. well, right? Um, it's well, you so- you just went to Nick Amanda Lee. She established her readership early. Was one one of the first on the uh, self published author train. But once she got a reader, she never let them go. She said, "I am going to give you a book, two books a month, every month from here on out to to infinity." Mm-hmm. And she does other things for them. So her first block of readers that pretty much gives her that hundred k of income the, in the month. But she's expanding that, and they don't leave. That's all on her. That's on quality. That's on her engagement. Yep. She does some marketing, but her her investment is in those readers to satisfy their needs. They know what's coming, and that's what that's what you need to do. Whether it's because some people say I don't have a newsletter list, but I have a blog. Well, they're blogging every day. They're bringing yep. the readers to them. They're satisfied. They're doing something. You must satisfy your readers. You must keep them engaged, and that's all marketing, even though it may not be a paid ad. Absolutely. And then something I was saying at Nink is like every drink being bought at that Tiki bar, all these hotel rooms, all the convention money, it's all coming from one source. It's not Amazon. It's not traditional publishing. It's the readers. It's yeah. reader money. Yeah. Right. Yep. And if you're not, the closer you get to that, like that was the, that was the, people forget with, with Amazon, what made them grow so fast was that they were focused on making that the the least amount of friction in that relationship, right? Like what was the, def- the patent that they defended the most was the one click buy. Yeah. Right. Because they knew how they had done the study and know that just to add a second click costs them 30%. Of, right. Right. Yeah. So you multiply that times a billion. It's a pretty interesting problem to make sure you've got solved. Yes. And I think that's the part that um, some of the stuff becomes counterintuitive when you give uh, readers all these different ways to connect with you. And it's like, then they get confused and they don't know what the relationship should be with you. Like if you make it really easy to have a good, solid, meaningful relationship, then like you said, like with Amanda Lee, they're going to stick around. Yeah. Right? Yep. And she's kept, and she, she is fanatical about keeping her readers on board as she should be, as every author should be. You don't want to say, well, I, my readers are jerks, so I'm going to I'm gonna kill off the characters. I'm going to start a new pen name. And it, okay, well, just understand you're all new work. That's right. That's right. All right, man. Well, this has been another great set of talks with you. I know we covered a lot of stuff, but... Um, Write compelling fiction. Successful <laughs> indie author series. They're all... Uh, I'd, I'd like to think they're all good books. The first three are on sale. At least for a little while. I don't know. Maybe I'll keep 99 cents forever. Who knows? I, I, mm-hmm. It's a, uh, uh, I'll keep my 99 cents for a while. If sales drop off, I'll jack them back up to 499. So then I can put them back on sale later. Okay. But uh, right now the first three volumes uh, are, are well release strategies one day and a few hours later are still at 499, but it's going to go down to 99 cents. Uh, today is September or October 2nd. So uh, please uh, good luck, enjoy, and uh, uh, help yourself because no one is responsible for success besides you. Amen. All right, Craig, good talking to you, and uh, Thanks, we'll, we'll be doing this again. Party on.